that recording start your recording okay so go to meeting upgraded their software yesterday um, so it was really great timing for this meeting obviously um, had to figure that out at the last minute so uh, welcome good morning everybody my name is Corey Anderson I am the president of the Rocky Mountain NetSuite user group um, and I'd like to welcome you to our meeting today so the very first thing that we're gonna um, talk about is our agenda for the morning uh, first of all, uh, we'll have, well, we already did this first part, breakfast and networking. Um, from 8.30 to 8.50, that's, uh, this is me talking to you. It's our welcome and our general business of the user group um, information. Um, then for 10 minutes, we are going to hear from StrongPoint, our meeting sponsor, and I'll talk a little bit about our meeting sponsorship later on here. Presentation today. Day, which is why you are here, ended by Lucians. We may take a break in there. That's up to Jeremy if he wants to take a break. Uh, but after Jeremy's presentation, we'll definitely uh, take a break for about 15 minutes. After that, um, I have a tip and trick to show you. And then we'll have our open forum and our net and networking after that. If you're not familiar with our open forum, it gives everybody a chance to ask the group um any questions or any challenges that you've been having um you know maybe they're really hard questions or simple questions it doesn't really matter you can ask and hopefully there's somebody here who's experienced it before it can help you with that with that problem so we'll go ahead and move on here so first of all i'd like to say thank you to coda coffee uh, coda coffee um, is our coffee sponsorship for our meetings um, and the coffee is delicious, so thank you very much um, for helping us with that Coda Coffee. They are also a NetSuite user, just FYI. Next thing I'll talk about is our membership uh, to the user group. Um, our membership count is 997 members. And if I looked right now, it might actually be over a thousand because I pulled this a few days ago and we had some late registrations to the meeting. So we may be over a thousand members now if not we're still very close membership is free um, you register for membership at our MNS if you have not registered before
muted. Okay. Well, we'll leave this as it is for now. Um, if you can hear me um, viewing remotely, you can definitely hear me. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So, apologies. Um, anyway, so our membership um, also gives you access to our LinkedIn form. I'll talk about that a little bit more here in a moment. Um, you also have um, access to a $400 discount to Sweet World, which I'll talk about in a moment as well. And um, as a member, you also have the ability to apply for CPE credits. And if you um, RSVP for this meeting, um, you should have received an email this morning about the CPE credits. I'll talk a little bit uh, more about that in detail in a moment as well. Um, if you are not a member yet and you RSVP for this meeting, please um, sign up for a membership at our website, rmnsug.org. Um, that way it ensures that you keep getting uh, messages and emails from us in the future. All right. Um, so our LinkedIn user group, we have 456 members. The purpose of our LinkedIn user group is to support fellow members with questions and answers, maybe follow up with uh, questions or answers that we have from that come up in meetings here, like questions that are way too hard to answer on the fly. Um, and so uh, please, please if, use this forum um, to ask questions to help other people as well. We also use it for announcements um, for our meetings, so presentations, um, notes when the Sweet World discount is available. That's kind of our main channel of communication um, to the user group. You also have the ability to post job openings uh, if you have anything, or if you're looking for a job, you can post on there as well. Um, and so again, that's our LinkedIn user group, a link on our website uh, to go to directly to that form. It is a closed community, so you need to be a member of the user group. Um, and we do that so that it doesn't get too spammy with a whole bunch of random companies uh, posting things on there so that it's actually a useful form. Couple of reminders, evaluations will be emailed to you today to complete. Um, please take a few minutes to uh, fill out those evaluations. We do use that information um, to help guide uh, the board as far as what we do um, with, this, with the user group meetings. Walk-in attendees, I mentioned this before, but if you um, didn't already, please register an RSVP on the iPad at the front of the room. Um, and then also, please register for our meetings or events using the same email as your membership record so you don't end up with two memberships. So as a user group, we use NetSuite to run the user group. And if you sign up with multiple email addresses, that is the key for a new customer record in NetSuite. And and so you'll end up with multiple customer records and multiple emails. So if you don't want that to happen, then just make sure you use that same email address all the time. Wi-Fi here today is spotty. Um, the DFC guest is the open Wi-Fi that, that um, all you attendees are able to access. Uh, there's no password required, um, but it's a little bit touch and go. So if you really need internet access during the meeting and you have um, like maybe a hot spot available through your phone, I'd recommend using that because uh, the DFC guest is uh, touching. So I would like to welcome our new board uh, member. She is our new speaker chair. Uh, so welcome uh, Peggy, I'm sorry, Peggy Evliff from RSMUS. She is standing right up uh, in the back there. Um, Peggy, <laughs> Very nice. So Peggy has been on the board now for about a month and a half-ish. Um, she came on right before the holidays. Um, so like I said, she's with RSMUS. She has expertise in the arena of international subsidiary and multi-currency accounting. She has a broad understanding of international reporting requirements and multi-book accounting and a lot of other ERP related things, but those are some of her specialties. And she has worked with multiple ERP systems uh, and, is, and is now with RSM's NetSuite practice. But um, how far back do you go with ERP systems? 1996. <laughs> Pre Windows. Okay. Okay. So you've seen the evolution of the ERP concept over time. That's fantastic. Well, so let's all give Peggy a round of applause. Welcome. 
Peggy. So she is our new speaker chair who will be responsible for um, organizing uh, presenters, the presentations, the content, um, and all of those aspects of our of our board. Um, currently, we are looking for an events chair board member. Um, we are looking for an end user for this position. Um, as a board, we try and, well, we're actually required to balance the types of board members between um, NetSuite consulting firms or VARs and end users. And right now, if we added another um, VAR to the board, we would be too heavy in the VARs. So we really need an end user. Um, if anybody's interested in contributing to the user group, um, you can please talk to me in person or you can email me at prez at rmnsug.org if you are interested. Um, basically, this role is, is responsible for managing our user group meetings. So here today, like ordering breakfast and getting the breakfast and making sure everything flows smoothly. Um, we haven't had an events chair for a while. Um, so we all kind of, the whole board absorbed all of those roles or all of those tasks. But we'd love somebody to um, help us manage that. So in addition to managing the meetings, we have a board meeting uh, every other month that we don't have a user group meeting. And so the commitment is typically um, a few hours on the off months and then the time here at the meeting. So if you're interested, please let me know. So I'm gonna talk about CPE credits. So um, CPE credits are, they, they stand for Continuing Professional Education. They are for CPAs. If you are not a CPA, you don't need to worry about this. Um, we have a, a new process, so the CPE credits are sponsored by I Bailey. So we have um, a team of folks uh, that work to um, facilitate all of the, you know, the CPE credits that we do for these meetings. And so if you signed up or RSVP'd and checked the CPE credits box, you should have received at least one email this morning and then another one um, hopefully a few days ago. I know some people didn't get it a few days ago. Um, and so that gives you the instructions on how to do um, or how to obtain the CPE credits for this, uh, for this meeting. We have two credits available today. Um, you received also a PDF that explains this. It's, it's a really simple process. You go to the URL, you put in your name and email, um, and then you, ch you choose the option that says guest slash client of I Bailey. Um, and then you, you're going to put in your session check-in code, which I'll give you here in a minute. Um, so you'll put in your check-in code at the beginning of the meeting, and then you'll put in your check-out code at the end of the meeting. And Jeremy is going to give you the check-out code at the end of his presentation. And then you will uh, receive those CPE credits within, I believe, 15 uh, days after this meeting. So our session check-in code for this morning is reporting. Um, so you can go ahead and do the check-in, the URL you received in the email that was sent to you this morning. If you have problems with this, you can email info at rmnsug.org. That'll ultimately get to me, and I will help um, with the CPE credits if you're having um, trouble getting those. We have a little bit of wiggle room on the time since this is a new process for the user group. Um, so please, you can email me and let me know if, if you're having problems with that. <clears throat> so I'd like to ask real quick, is, how many people here, is this your first time meeting? A show of hands. Okay, so that's a pretty good amount. I'd say almost 20 people. Um, so welcome. Um, we're going to take a minute to uh, go through a few member announcements. So if you have anything to announce, such as uh, job openings, or if you are looking for a job, um, we can go ahead. <clears throat> now is the time to uh, mention that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll start by saying that I Bailey is currently hiring um, for NetSuite consultants. We have a few different um, positions available. Um, Mark Breckheisen is in our booth at the back, uh, waving his hand right now. Um, and he can tell you more about that if you're interested or if you know somebody that is interested. Um, you can also, uh, we'll have um, information posted on our LinkedIn form about that as well. 
So I'm going to go ahead and open it up to anybody else. Does anybody else have any announcements, any job openings, or anything with it? I'll try and repeat it for Yes. So, this is Christian so, from DZ Solutions. They are hiring general NetSuite consultants as well as people that are specializing in your craft solutions. And did you guys post that on the Okay. I know that you've mentioned that before as well. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. So that's Ann Holland Adventures or Ann Ann Holland Adventures looking for a system. Sorry. This admin applications. Hi. Welcome. Come on in. Trying to figure out how to mute this thing. Um, follow up with that. Anybody else? Okay. Go ahead and move on. Thank you. So meeting sponsorship. Um, the these meetings are supported by two levels of sponsorship. We have a sweet app sponsor and a breakfast sponsor. Sweet app sponsors must be available through sweetapp.com, so they're certified by NetSuite. Uh, and our breakfast sponsors must offer NetSuite consulting services and have certified NetSuite consultants on staff. Um, our goal of having those two types of sponsorship is to give us um, visibility into the different types of solutions that can plug into NetSuite. And then also, if you are looking for um, consulting support with NetSuite, so we try, we try and keep the um, sponsorship rounded out that way. If you or your company is interested in sponsoring, um, you can view the, see the information for sponsorship at rmnsug.org forward slash sponsorship. So our upcoming meetings, um, March of this year, we are going to do revenue recognition or RevRec um, as it's often called, and that is going to be presented by um, Mike Tackline. Uh, so we're excited for that. And then we'll, we will also, do you remember that Mike? Okay, you had a surprised look on your face. <laughs> um, and then we're also going to have our 2020.1 uh, updates. So we'll talk about any of the cool features that have um, that are coming up in our 20.1 uh, next week upgrade. Um, in May this year, we're going to go through our workflow meeting and um, workflow slash suite flow. Is that the other the other term, suite flow? Um, I just call it workflow. Uh, but then we'll also have our Sweet World update. Sweet World will have just happened in April, and so uh, we'll send a board member, which I'll talk about in a minute, and she will give us our Sweet World update. July, we're going to have Back to Basics on our NetSuite 101. Um, so that's a meeting that will be designed for people that are brand new to NetSuite, kind of go through some of the, um, the very entry-level aspects of it. And then in September is our customization meeting, so we'll talk about fields, records, centers, lists, and tabs and how to customize all of that stuff to do what you want it to do. Uh, and then we'll have our 2020.2 update uh, section as well. Sweet World this year is April 20th through 23rd. Um, we will have a 40 or a $400 registration discount code. It's they give it to us closer to the conference date. Um, it is the same as the current early bird discount. And so they, if you uh, aren't sure if you're gonna go and you don't get into the early bird sign up window, we'll have that discount code available for you to sign up um, closer to um, the actual uh, event itself. Marty Cominos this year will represent the user group at the meeting. Uh, we'll also have some other board members present. I should be there. Um, Mike is usually there, not sure yet, but um, hopefully if, if you are planning on attending, we'll see you there. There is one luncheon, uh, a birds of a feather meeting, and they have different tables for the different user groups around the country. And so on that day, if you are at Sweet World, try and come and, and uh, hang out and we can chat at uh, chat over lunch at the uh, Birds of a Feather lunch. So I'd like to say thank you to our sponsors today. Our Sweet App sponsor is StrongPoint, who will um, come up here in just a couple of minutes. Um, we're running a little behind, so we'll have to um, <clears throat> we'll extend that a little bit. And then our breakfast sponsor today is iBailey, and iBailey offers consulting services. You can talk to anybody at the iBailey table there about what we do. Um, and both 
companies have a giveaway today. And so if you haven't had a chance yet, you can put your business cards in the baskets on the table and um, they'll do a drawing. So um, StrongPoint is going to give away a Google Home device as well as two separate drawings, right? Yeah, two separate drawings. Um, the second drawing will be for a six month strong point um, license for your company. Um, and strong point is really cool. He'll tell you all about it. And also um, for, for the strong point drawing, people that are viewing uh, remotely, if you're interested in dropping your name in the drawing for that, you can chat your name and email address into the chat window and uh, Liam is monitoring that and he'll put you into the drawing for that as well. For the I Bailey, we are um, whoever is present only for that, um, for that drawing. So I'd like to take just a couple minutes. We're gonna switch over. I'm gonna ask um, Liam Ganey to come up and um, he will give us a quick. It's really cool. I've never had one of these lapel microphones before, but it's good because I'm on a stage and when I have one of the handheld microphones, I feel like singing in this way. It's made of course, so this is probably going to go better this way. So uh, I'm just going to talk to one slide here and give you kind of a high level overview of, of everything StrongPoint does. Um, so it, there are kind of three different levels of StrongPoint depending on what you might need for your company. And the first, the first tier, the first level, the first step is really the first two bullet points. So when you install StrongPoint into NetSuite, you get perfect visibility to what customizations are in NetSuite, how they're connected, who's using them. Um, if you want to change a field, it's immediately obvious to you if that field is being used by a search and so on. So it's really easy to make sure that you never break anything by accident. NetSuite is an amazing tool because you can customize it to do just about whatever you want. But then you're left managing a highly complex system and it can be easy to break things by accident if you don't have visibility to exactly how your system is configured. And then once you do have that perfect picture, you can make really good decisions about what to clean up, um, run use fields, automatically get rid of junk, save searches that meet your criteria. So that's really the first step. Figure out what you have, get rid of the crap. And then step two is around enabling faster, safer change, especially if you've got multiple people involved in making changes to NetSuite. So the change, you can have change controls, which are also rules or policies about who's allowed to make what kinds of changes in NetSuite. So when you say, I want to make, I want to change this field, StrongPoint will immediately tell you, yeah, go ahead, that's safe to do in production, you won't break anything, or that's probably safe, but ask so-and-so in finance first, or no, you got to fill out a change request and ask IT to look at that for you first. StrongPoint integrates natively with ticketing services, or you can use it in, uh, in NetSuite on its own. But those change requests and approvals will automatically generate an impact analysis for you. So when you say, this is what I want to change, immediately you know what is involved in making that change. All the research into how to do the change is done like that before the person making the change or the person approving the change ever gets to look at that change request. And then the environment comparison, second last bullet point, I may show you that if we have time, um, is often used for after you've made changes to validate that everything was done correctly. See if you sweep on the move objects or if you build in sandbox, test and then rebuild in production. StrongPoint can make sure that what you've got in sandbox is identical to what you have in production. And if they're not, it'll pinpoint exactly what the differences are line by line uh, in case you need to, to fix anything. Really good scanning two screens visually for differences in lines of code and StrongPoint can just tell you. So StrongPoint is really kind of the bookends on your development or any changes in it. It'll help you do the research before you make a change, um, then you do your changes and test, and then it'll validate that everything happened correctly and give you incredibly granular reporting on what those changes were, right down to knowing if a change happened that should have gotten an approval first but didn't. You can see those on a report, which is especially crucial if you need SOX compliance, if you're public or in kind of regulated industry. Um, so we'll automate about 90% of the IT audit prep that you would normally have to do for an audit for SOX compliance. And we'll even make segregation of duties native to this. Instead of uh, um, all the other options, you can just go to an employee record, assign a role, allowed, it'll go through. If not, it can be blocked or just logged and an infraction happens. 
uh, often, especially if you've got a smaller, maybe smaller accounting team, you've got to have people who can um, approve their own journal entries, but it's also important to know that those two permissions, approving and posting a journal entry, are with the same person, so you can accommodate for it, uh, because there is some financial risk involved. So, step number one, figure out what you have, get rid of the crap. Step two, enable faster, safer change within NetSuite. And then step three, if you need it, be compliant. 100% compliant all the time. No audit prep. I'll skip over to NetSuite. I'm going to show you two of my favorite tools in StrongPoint. Um, there are lots more things you can do with StrongPoint, of course, in NetSuite, but I'm just going to show you a couple of the basics. So, what we're looking at here is one way of viewing the documentation. So this is called an ERD entity relationship diagram, it's kind of like a tree diagram. So what I've done here is chosen the customer record, and then all the objects that live on that customer record are are populated immediately. So if somebody comes to you and says, "Hey, can we make a change to that company size field?" You just click on the field. And immediately you can see pop out the side exactly what it's connected to. You can see there are a couple of searches connected to that field. I can open them up to see who the owner is or when they were last used. Looks like Leo owns this search, so I can go ask him if I want to make a change to something that his search is using as a field or a filter. Um, but this is pretty much an easy change to make. No scripts, no workflows, and in two seconds you've got a good answer about how long is this change going to take you to make. Something I can do by lunch, or this is going to maybe be a couple of weeks for some testing and sampling. But either way, I could go into your NetSuite account tomorrow and make really good decisions about what I can change and what I can't, at least what I can't easily with uh, some expertise. And there are automatic ways of doing this. You can just punch in a strong point, this is the field I want to change, and you'll get an answer. But it's important to understand this is kind of what's going on under the hood. This is how the documentation works, and this is how we make connections for you, I guess. I will also show you the uh, environment comparison here. Um, probably, possibly the biggest time saver, my favorite tool of what we have in StrongPoint anyway. So it's it probably difficult for some of you to see this, but what we're doing is we log into a source environment on this side, like Sandbox, log into a target environment over here, like production, and then you can identify some objects that you want to compare for how they exist in Sandbox versus production. Some people will use this for regression testing uh, before the um, NetSuite release to make sure your scripts are going to operate the same way and new releases to do in production. Um, most, most commonly used for uh, deployment validations to make sure that what you've got in production now is exactly the same as what you tested in the sandbox. And if it's not, what are the differences? If we were looking at scripts, we could go right down to the line of code, very granular. I'm just going to show you a basic search here, I'll show the differences. And we get green for new, red for old, exactly what the differences are um, between the search and sandbox versus production. So, you know, it's impossible to make a mistake this way, or let's sweep on they make a mistake for you. I am going to leave it there and give us back a couple of minutes. Um, like we mentioned, we're giving away free flashlight licenses for six months. Well, there's another prize, so drop a drop a business card in there, take a pamphlet if you like, I'm happy to answer any more questions. So thank you. Thank you, Rick. Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for our overview of Sweet Analytics Workbooks. Um, so today we're going to be going through just kind of a general overview and we'll start and kind of dip our toe into the water in terms of overall setup, how to get access to these. Uh, then we'll start diving down into some uh, uh, actual data set creations, um, you know, into some of the more functional aspects of workbooks, which are going to be our pivot tables as well as charts. Uh, then they could a uh, bit of a deeper dive into some of the standard workbooks that NetSuite's kind of published for us in order to give us a pretty good starting point and then into some practical use cases of, so these are some things that we've built out and actually done for clients uh, where uh, workbooks ended up being the appropriate solution. Uh, then talk through some limitations. There are quite a few. Uh, it's good to understand these before we get into them. And then we'll dive into a Q&A session. So somewhere along the way here, uh, we will take a little break, bit of a break. I know two hours is a long time to sit and uh, pay attention to anything. So uh, at a logical place, we will take a break in there. Um, but uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Jeremy King. I am a principal at uh, Doozy Solutions. Uh, Doozy Solutions is a NetSuite exclusive consulting firm. Uh, we don't do any other ERP systems. It's entirely NetSuite focused. So um, 
you know, we were a group of people that just basically are masters of one thing as opposed to, you know, kind of dabbling in a bunch of other things. Uh, I personally have been utilizing uh, NetSuite since 2007 or 2008. I think we bought it in seven and uh, we're finally live in 2008. Um, I was originally as a CFO of a publicly traded software company. So I've got to use this system um, for many years as, uh, you know, as an end user and in uh, 2012 switched over to being over on the consulting side and I've been there uh, ever since. Uh, so I've really seen this uh, product develop and grow and change and I think that the uh, these uh, sweet analytics workbooks are one of the kind of the biggest step forwards I've seen in a long time. Uh, certainly does not mean that they're perfect but I think they're on the uh, step to a lot of great things that we can do with this and I'm excited to share some of that with you today. So a bit of an overview. And uh, I know these will all be made available, but hopefully you can see this. Um, you know, in order to set this up, really in the enable features aspect, we've got to go in and go into enable features, go into the analytics uh, sub tab there, and you're going to find a checkbox there for Sweet Analytics workbooks. So that's kind of step number one. I don't think you can magnify the slides. We certainly can when we get to the browser. Uh, but again, this is under uh, enable features, so set up enable features, analytics, sub tab, and then we want to make sure that the suite analytics uh, uh, little checkbox there is checked. So that's kind of one that's going to enable it throughout the account. Uh, really step two in, of a two-step process is we want to make sure that you've got the appropriate roles have access to this. And so this is a shot of you know, configuring a role. Uh, so that's going to be set up users, you know, manage roles. And then under the uh, report sub tab, we want to make sure that we've got Sweet Analytics workbook, and then you can choose the appropriate uh, permission for that. But we're going to need at least edit if you want anybody to be able to go in and modify any of these things that I'm going to show you today. So that's about it when it comes to the actual setup and kind of configuration um, in, in terms of being able to give users or yourselves access to, uh, to get into uh, the actual analytics piece. Um, and I'll just go ahead and switch over and we'll kind of walk through some of these uh, specifically. So Margie, hopefully you can see I can zoom in a little bit on these. Uh, but that first one, I know I'm muted, don't remind me again, is going to be just simply set up, company, enable features. Analytics and make sure that this checkbox is done. Then we're going to go set up users roles, manage roles, and whatever the role is that you actually want to manage. Click customize on your roles. On the report sub tab, make sure that suite analytics is selected here and you can see the types of it's basically edit or nothing. So that's going to be the, the core of it and once that happens up on your main dashboard or anywhere you are uh, you're going to get the analytics tab which is going to take us to basically everything that we're going to be performing today is going to be from here. So when I click on analytics we should now have full access to uh, everything we're going to look at. And I will just keep going back and forth between this and our uh, uh, you know, the presentation itself here because there are uh, certain things that we want to keep in mind here when it comes to the actual data set. So everything uh, within Suite Analytics workbooks result, or revolves around a data set. And I mean, really the first thing that we're going to do for anything is go and build that data set. And we'll walk through kind of, you know, how to do that. But uh, it's definitely a different framework than what we've seen in the past. Uh, and we'll certainly dive into to some of those idiosyncrasies, but that data set is then, you know, it can be useful in and of itself here, but then we can take it to really the next levels of those data sets and being able to really dive into that data in terms of what's being returned uh, through the use of charting. And this is, we've got, uh, I think there's like six or seven different chart types we have there, or being able to, to create pivot tables. Now, if anybody's ever used that pivot tables bundle that NetSuite had in the past that I don't ever think got outside of beta, um, this is so much easier, it's unbelievable. Uh, that was very complex and difficult. This really does make it easy to be able to go in and do those deep dives and basically a lot of things that you used to have to do to export stuff out into Excel uh, and be able to like get that kind of reporting we can now do directly through the, uh, the, the interface. But everything is going to start with a data set. Uh, and if you are 
very experienced, especially with safe searches. Um, you really need to unlearn what you've learned previously uh, because it's entirely different and there's a lot of things. So this is Yoda and he's telling us now that, yeah, we've got to go in and take all those years and that sweet experience we have and kind of throw them out the door. Really open your mind to being able to go in and jump into something different. Uh, because here, there are no pre-built joins. Now a safe search, if you were to go in and select, you know, you've got you know, a typical transaction search or something, you'd go in and uh, you'd go into your criteria or your results tab in terms of what we're pulling. A lot of fields in there are pre-built, but they're not necessarily uh, you know, built on the kind of the native NetSuite tables. Here it's entirely, uh, you know, you really tr have access to the true data model. But what that means is that each step along the way, we've got to put what joins we want to within the system. Those are not done for us as safe searches were. Uh, there's a lot of fields that we're used to uh, in safe searches that don't exist because they really never existed in the data structure themselves. They were something that was created uh, to be used in the safe search. I mean, one particular example I'll use, if, if anybody's familiar with uh, any manufacturing, there's a concept on a production order, work order, called built. And that, shows the total number of you know, actually units that have been built on that. That doesn't exist in the data structure. Uh, it was completely fabricated for safe searches and, you know, and to be able to report on it. But if you were to go into here, you will not find built. It doesn't exist. It's a constructed field that actually sums up you know, kind of child transactions that roll up. And so it can be very confusing as you're jumping and diving into this because you're not going to find some of those fields that you've counted on for years and years and years. But with this um, new kind of structure comes a lot of additional benefits. One is you've got total flexibility in terms of how you're returning results. Uh, you can go in and manually construct those joins, you know, one to many, many to many, um, and being able to go multiple tables away, which was always a constraint with safe search, is you could only get to one table away. Anything that had those three dots after it, that was it. Uh, you weren't able to go and do another join on any of those. Uh, so that's completely been wiped away. Um, and so it's uh, much more granular in terms of how we can go and determine those results. Um, if anybody was using multi-book accounting before, safe searches were fairly useless if you're trying to report on anything else. This now, because of that ultimate granularity and everything gives you full ability, um, you know, and, and total support for the uh, multi-book uh, aspects of it. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned before, it is the true data model there. So if you're ever wondering why NetSuite does some of the things it does, this will give you a lot better understanding to that because you really are seeing the underlying tables here for the first time where Safe Search uh, was really, uh, uh, had pulled some of the wool over your eyes. Some of it was, was done to make it easy, you know, where I could find that built and immediately report on it. Uh, but if you've ever really been on the back end trying to, you know, uh, script or anything else, you can... I mean, that we ran into limitations and didn't understand why things work. This makes it a lot easier. But with that comes some drawbacks. Um, this is definitely much more of a do-it-yourself. So you were going to find uh, some of these things going to take a little bit more time. Um, need to have a little bit better methodology in terms of how you're constructing these things. Probably a little bit more testing for your results to make sure that we're capturing the, you know, the, uh, you know, what's being uh, expert output here to make sure that is exactly what we're looking for. And as I'll get through this, you'll even see me get through and I'll try to start at the top and be very methodical about how I'm building all these to make sure I don't miss a step or, uh, you know, link to uh, the wrong table at some place down in the uh, transaction structure, because uh, there's definitely a lot of opportunity for error out there, uh, you know, as a result of this. And I just want to highlight this because I think the vast majority of the searches that we all do in this room are transaction related. And it used to be that we just went a transaction search, you know, a new safe search type transaction, uh, and we're up, out and running. I mean, setting criteria, setting results, and we're always limited in terms of what uh, we could do here. Uh, and we'd just be pulling everything from that transaction side. But this is the necessary transaction data model that you need to set up every time you're doing a transaction search now. So we're going to start with that basic transaction search, and we'll jump in with real life uh, scenarios as we go through this. And that's we're going to pull what we used to be considered things like header information. But that whole idea of header line item uh, stuff has really gone away here um, as we get into how this is actually constructed. Uh, so the transaction, we're still going to be able to pull things like entity, dates, total amounts. Uh, and of course, that's going to be total amount in the actual uh, transaction currency. 
Uh, if I need to pull any more information in terms of line item information, I'm going to need to build that join between the transaction and the transaction line at that point. Now I can pull line item, line item information, again, in the transaction currency there, you know, item information, quantities, rates, things like that. But that join has to be built first before I can get to any of that information. And then if I want uh, any additional true accounting in information from this, I need to do another join from that transaction line to a transaction accounting line. And this again is just, this is how NetSuite was set up the entire way. They had just built these links in for us and save searches. Now it's up to us to go and build these things. But once I do that link over there and do that join, now I can pull out line uh, or you know amounts and actual base currencies. Uh, now I can hit the uh, you know the actual accounts, GL numbers, everything else. But I've got to manually build uh, those links between the two. And then once I built like the transaction line, then I can do other things that are specifically on that transaction line. Things like item. Now I can source an information from the item. You know, what item type is it? Purchase price. Other things that are actually stored on the uh, the item record. And the same thing over on the transaction line. Once I built those, now it can start leaking into these. But you can see how this can grow and kind of swell into much much more complex uh, queries that we're able to perform. Uh, but all of this is going to be done basically manually every time to make sure we're getting the results that we need. And so if there's one slide that you guys come back to, it should be this one on this because this is the overall concept of how these need to be constructed in order to return the results that you want. All right, and with that, let me jump into our analytics. Is that big enough for everybody to see? No, no bigger. All right, so a couple things as we jump in. This is all um, accessed directly by clicking on the analytics uh, tab in your main uh, dashboard bar here, menu. Uh, a couple features, you can go and search for any of them if you're looking for, so if I put sales, it's gonna immediately show me sales Bible. This is one that we've created here, uh, but as this grows, uh, it's gonna become a lot more important to be able to search for these as we're, uh, have. A, a bunch of them in here. I'm just going to collapse these so we can kind of look at them one by one. Uh, but down here we're going to see our recently opened and this is going to be specifically for you which of these workbooks that we have in the system. Um, it's going to go basically in chronological order in terms of the last time we've run them. It's going to be based on this run date automatically. So again it makes it really easy to get back to any of those uh, you know that we've been using. My workbooks are specifically ones that I have created uh, for myself. And so again, I can track in all of these that are uh, specifically belong to me as the owner. Shared with me, we'll walk through how other people can create workbooks and then share them with other roles or specific users within the system. And anything that's been specifically shared with me that's been created by any other user is going to show up here. So that's really the difference between my workbooks, the stuff with me shared, shouldn't hit that, sorry, uh, is gonna be stuff created by others and shared with me. Employee workbooks, if you are, uh, an administrator, I believe you should see everything that everybody's created here so that you can immediately jump in and access those if you need to. Um, and then you can share those with other people, et cetera. So you basically go in and be able to take ownership of those. And then standard workbooks. I know we're going to come back to this, but this is a, a series of starting points as I'd like to consider them um, for um, basically come right out of the out of the box with it but some kind of preset ones uh, with some kind of standard use cases in there and we'll dive into some of these as we go through but that's kind of the overall dashboard kind of focus of this but if i want to do go and create a new workbook as I'm, we're frequently going to do with this system we're simply going to create a new workbook and very similar to like creating a new safe search we're going to basically say all right what's the core record the starting record that we want to start with and so uh, if you look in here, you'll see standard 1099 miscellaneous categories. I mean, some things you're very familiar with. Any of your custom records are going to show up here as well. So this is fully compliant and usable with anything that you've created. And then the, as we scroll down here, you're gonna see some other ones. And I believe if I had to, the insight in terms of why they were created, let me just go by record category because you can sort by all these. But you'll see there's a couple other in here called the analyticals. And these are some of, they're, they're basically data sets, data models that have been created ahead of time that have some of these pre-joins for you. So if you were looking for that field built, because 
it's one of those things that you just relied on for years and years and years. They've actually, this one's the manufacturing transaction, it's only in beta, but they've gone and tried to recreate some of those different fields in there. So they're fields that don't actually exist, but they programmed them in there for that ease of use. Um, and I believe that we're gonna see more and more of these analytical uh, workbooks to help people make that transition from save search over to the uh, suite analytics workbooks. And so those three of them available for us already. <clears throat> Um, and we can start those, our searches directly from these because they are immediately available to us. And we'll, we will come back and, and look at some of those, but uh, we're going to start now <clears throat> with what we showed in that, uh, in the presentation, which is kind of a standard transaction search. And of course, they put it near the bottom, so it takes a while. There we go. So this is just the standard good old transaction search. Very familiar. If you've done a lot of save searches, we're going to start it very much the same way. So that's going to bring up uh, and immediately going into the data set. Uh, that's going to be our core starting point each time. Data set must be built before we can do any of the really reporting off it in terms of charting or um, any of the pivot tables. Now, some of the great features in here. Um, is if you're searching for fields, you can just type that in here. So quantity, and it's going to go, and you're going to see how many actually things return quantity, because now we've opened up this not just to uh, a transaction um, record and anything joined, but we can go to join, to join, to join, to join. So there's a lots of different uh, uh, different options that we can actually pick there. So I find that this is, this is useful at some times, but for things like that, they're going to return a lot like quantity, it's best just to go down through the actual uh, tree structure. Um, these little chevrons are just going to collapse to give me more uh, access to the actual data over here. And if I wanna expand those out, just click on those again. But really the meat and potatoes of all this is going to come down here where we've got uh, on the left-hand side here. So uh, formulas, you can go and build any formula. We'll certainly do some of those as we go through this. But what I like to do when I'm starting on this is you're gonna have transaction, which is gonna be the core record. It's gonna be the first thing underneath formula and that's gonna be my starting point every time. Now, once I click on that, any results that are in the header of that transaction are going to immediately show up here on the right-hand side. Now, this is different than the 2019.1, which is, I thought, kind of confusing. I kind of like this 20.2 or 19.2, whatever it is now. Uh, layout, much better. I think it's a, a lot easier to follow. But anything that's highlighted here in blue, the, effectively the header fields are going to show here. And then when I select this transaction here, anything that's a uh, joined record that can be expanded and anything else will show up underneath here. And so if I wanted to you know, specifically click on adjustment type from this, you can see now I've got several different other fields. But starting with our transactions, uh, you'll notice some are in blue, others are in or just standard black. What that's signifying is the ones in blue have already been added to my data set over here, effectively my results if you're trying to translate this from uh, safe search. So you'll see date, you know, if I was to remove date here, Try to remove memo. I can't even do those right now because of their standard, I guess. But um, as I add, if I put number of turns over here, you're going to see that's going to go up and show here. Again, I should be able to just remove these, but oh, it's because I need to scroll. So if you want to remove column, just click on your three dots, remove column, and that'll go away. Now, one of the things that confused me is I'm looking like crazy because I want to add one of these to a filter or something. And so I'm looking for quantity or something down here or date. And lo and behold, date created, date, date's not down here. And it gets confusing. It's because it's up here. So as soon as you use it in your filter, you got to remember that it's up at the top. And so if you're down there searching, it might very well be that, well, it's there the whole time. It's just, um, it's been reordered for you. So it's one of these things that you'll just get used to, but uh, that stumped me many a time. <clears throat> so back to our list here. Again, this is going to pull everything and uh, all your custom records or your custom fields are going to show up here as well. And so you can see that little icon right above my cursor here. That's showing me that uh, cleared by accounting is a custom field. And it also shows me what type of field there is. That little uh, uh, kind of checkbox switch shows me it's a true-false field. You know, 
Um, some of these will show that they're text, some will show that they're numbers, but you've got that just in that view, you being able to tell exactly what type of field those are. And obviously if it doesn't have the custom, like uh, billing status, we know that's a standard uh, NetSuite field. But we're gonna have all of the fields available on a transaction record, all listed out here. And if I want to go and add something over to my uh, results, um, let's find something realistic here, uh, license. So this is a custom field, but uh, might be important to what we're reporting on. I simply click this, hold it down, drag it, and drop it where I want it to go. That will add that immediately to my uh, results here. And I can continue just going on and building, grabbing what fields that I actually need from this. And again, now that it's added, license is gonna be up here if you're looking for it. As we continue to build kind of our results in terms of uh, you know, what fields we want to do, if I want to go and uh, bring in information from the line items of any of these, because this is all header information at this point, but if I want to go and bring in uh, line item information, I'm going to have to scroll down here. And I always want to start at the top because you'll see as I, you'll see as I build through this, we're going to go many, many levels deep and we want to make sure we're grabbing the right one. Uh, but we're going to come down to transaction line. And here, if I click on transaction line, you'll notice this turns blue. And now this is effectively the header level of anything on a transaction line. And so if I wanted to go and add uh, specifically item information from this, I could take item, drag it, drop it over here. Now it's gonna flash here because this has got some cool reporting features in terms of do I want parent-child relationships here or not? And so if I want child level only, just leave it as this and hit apply. But if I wanna show hierarchy, basically that whole parent-child relationship in my results, I can elect to do that here. This again was a limitation kind of on save searches where it got annoying where uh, a lot of times you had to like build formulas to take out parents and other things like that. Uh, but here we don't have to worry about that. If we just wanna see the child without the parent, just put show child level only and apply. So before we only had 33 results coming in here or pages, now we have over 500 because we just exploded this thing up very big. We basically added all of the items from all of our different uh, transactions in here. Uh, but then based on the transaction line, what I would now consider the header field, assuming that a transaction line is its own thing, now I can come in and grab different things like quantities, rates. So if I want to bring quantity in, if I want to bring rate in, and then amounts are a little bit different than what we're used to. Um, so these, again, are the standard kind of NetSuite data sets. Uh, so we're not going to see certain things that say like, uh, uh, I don't know if you're trying to pull an amount from a, you know, there was a specific section for things like transfer orders and other things like that. All of that stuff is gone, but uh, you're going to have this amount net or the amount transaction currency. Now, again, this is pulling specifically from the line item to be able to drag and drop these over here. So now we didn't really add anything uh, in terms of the size here, but we can go and pull all and everything that's really down at that line item level, but we're pulling it from a different table. Now, if I wanted to go and uh, expand on joined tables to transaction line, I'm gonna click this Chevron. And you can see here that's now opened up where not only can I pull, this would be all the header information, but if I wanna do a link, do a join on any of these other tables, that are joined at the header information. So if I wanted to go and pull uh, specifically from an item record, but I want more additional detail on that item, I can click on the item here, and this is now going to pull effectively the header information from the item record. So anything that I you know, personally care about, I know I use purchase price on um, my slides there. So if I wanna find purchase price, being able to go and add that into my list. And then if I want to drill in on the item even further and do joined records there, I can just keep repeating this process. So if I want to pull class, or if I want to do anything of a join on class, so I want to pull in the parent of that class, 
you can see how deep and deep and deep we can keep going but it can get very very tricky because this doesn't necessarily show well it shows a little bit but it's you really got to scroll up and down to see exactly where on that whole data structure you actually are and then i highly recommend when you've uh, finished something to collapse these as you go and find the next one so as item is is now expanded And transaction line all right kind of reset where i am within your your structure now if we want to pull any actual accounting information like we want to join to an account or something i mentioned before we've got to build that join in here so this is from the transaction line so we've already built transaction went down to transaction line now i want to go to my transaction accounting line and here you can see debit credit amounts these are where these are going to show up within the data structure. So if I wanted to do any kind of uh, information on accounts in terms of where that, uh, how that is posting, I'm gonna need to pull that from this transaction account line. I can't just go and pull, pull account like I used to be able to, you know, from a sense of, or go down to the three dots and say what type of account that is, or build a filter that says, hey, I wanna filter on account type only revenue or income accounts. You've gotta go down through this kind of multi-step level. But once you understand that, I think it, uh, as you use this, you get much, much quicker on it. Uh, it becomes, it's just, again, we have to unlearn kind of some of those things that we've done for so many years and just learn this new structure. So uh, once we've got and pulled in everything that we need to over on our data set, in terms of our uh, um, results, it's time to build some criteria. And so I'm just gonna start off at the uh, very top and you're gonna see me do this. I will always start at the top and then just kind of work my way through things. Um, we're, we're pulling transactions now, but I want to pull specifically uh, certain transaction types. And so, so like when I click on transaction, again, this is going to be the header information for transactions down here. And I want to pull in type as something that I want to go in and uh, create a filter on. <coughs> and of course, it's probably up at the top. It is, that's why I couldn't find it. You can see I did it right there. Um, it gets confusing like that. But if I want to filter on type, we've got this bar where it says drop fields here to add criteria. And that's exactly what we're going to do. I'm going to take type and I'm going to put it up here. And this is going to pop up now with all of my possible selections for transaction type over here on the left. And I want to do uh, production orders. So you can double click to move it over. You can do multi selects and then move them all over like that. Your shift key works for these for doing multi-selects as well. So it's whatever is gonna work best for, for you guys in terms of how to do that. I like to double click, uh, you know, for speed, but select whatever you want to. You gotta make sure it's here. If there's nothing here on the right side of the list, it'll tell you, it'll air out until you need to add something and hit apply. Now that's going to immediately reload. I can see I have 29 um, pages of this stuff and you'll see this little thing turning down here, loading summary, because this is going to tell me effectively uh, how many results I have based on everything that I filtered at this point. And then we can continue to add uh, other things to this. So another one we could add if I want to put status in here. And I've actually found it on this case. Just simply drag, drop it up here. And we can go and say, hey, where do you want to go and pull? Just, and you've got the search here, which is actually much, much faster than any other search in NetSuite in this new kind of thing. We're just pro, pro and it immediately, it doesn't go in circle and circle and circle. Uh, and you can see pro is an approval here, so I didn't have to use the percent sign as well. So that's just kind of already built in. Uh, other things that are just gonna save time. And so we just want to bring in production orders that are built or closed. So apply that. And that starts loading summary. Uh, in some cases, depending on the number of, of results that you expect to return, uh, I'd start with the criteria and then worry about the, the pieces of data. Just if you're going to wait for this to load, obviously the more uh, records it's going to load, the longer it's going to take. So if certainly goes much faster when you've got a lot of additional filters on it. And I'm just going to go back up here if I can. Cl 
collapse this. Because our whole grouping in criteria is very much visual now. I mean, if you remember the old parentheses and uh, it could get really difficult. Here we've got the ability to build as many groups in here as we want. And then we can specify within those groups of all of these are ands. We can do all of our ors directly in here. I can add a new group and treat where it's either meets the criteria of this group or it meets the criteria of this group. And it's just really easy to, to nail some of these um, different ones down in terms of what our actual criteria is going to be here. Uh, and then you can specify moving up and down. It's going to be, you know, certain preferences. Um, if you want to go, you know, move down, move to bottom. So as you're actually structuring your uh, queries, you can do all of those uh, directly from here. Uh, if you want to get rid of it entirely, simply click remove. And the three dots will, if I click on this, it'll show me exactly where that field is over on the left-hand side. Zooming in, it's kind of hard to see this. So let me zoom back out. And show in location list. Of course, this has to be expanded out. But it's going to go exactly to that table and saying, okay, you're pulling this from that particular table. That's helpful when, you, when you're not getting the results that you want or expect. It's probably because you're pulling it from the wrong table because there's definitely that opportunity at this time. All right, well, this is done. We can see 83 now. Uh, is my count in terms of what's been returned. Uh, some cool features, let me zoom out a little bit. And these can be, uh, your filters can be hidden and exposed as well through this. So as we're in super zoomed in mode, I recommend doing that. Uh, but one of the other cool things is if I wanna get some summary information on any of these, like uh, what's the sum of all of these, I can simply click on this and it's going to give me the immediate snapshot of that row basically like Excel would do if you selected all the rows. This will show me my count, uh, min, max, sum, average. So again, a, a, to me, that's a huge benefit, especially as you're going through criteria of just grabbing everything that's in any of those. And so we're gonna keep working, adding any of these that we want to, you know, through this data set um, until we get everything that we want to either potentially report on, because from, from this, we can take and export these results, uh, you know, drop those into Excel, but that's how we want to be able to utilize this data. Um, or when we get everything in here that we want, uh, we can go in and take that next step um, to creating either by clicking on the plus button here is how we're going to either add a pivot table or add a chart. So, oh, then uh, if, assuming you want to save this, you've got two different options, save as and save. So you'll notice I can't save as this because I haven't saved this to the, uh, um, to the system yet. So click save and you can name this whatever you want. This is going to be the Rocky Mountain NetSuite user group uh, demo set and apply. Now, assuming I want to share this workbook, not just the data set, but everything in it, if I want to share this, we've got our little share icon here. And here I can effectively publish this out or allow access to specific roles. I can also publish this out to specific people. And you'll notice that these people have to have that access because there's a lot more employees in here, but not everybody has been assigned a role that, uh, that can access these. And then in terms of permissions and everything else, the same permissions apply. If, if you're gonna report on items, you need to have access to be able to be at least view items. So all of those same permissions carry over, which is brilliant, which means you don't have to go back and rebuild. Uh, you know, your roles to make sure you've got, you know, specific access set up. So all of that gets inherited across the board here. Uh, so I'll open up to questions now specifically on data set. Any specific questions or anything that you guys have? I know we're going to have a Q&A section later, but I want to make sure some of if you do have them now, let's make sure we get them addressed. Yes. So if you 
Good question. Uh, specifically about, I'm just going to repeat it for the guys that are on the phone. Um, your data set, is it live? Does it need to be refreshed? Uh, it depends is really what it comes down to. If, you, if you're adding certain fields on, it will force a refresh of these. Um, you've also got, if you, because if I just added, as you saw, I added rate. And because I didn't expand the number of records in my field, it just went and put that on, but it didn't necessarily refresh the whole thing. So if you do want to refresh the whole data set, you click this icon here, and that will force the system to refresh from where you are. Now, in some cases, because there's other things built in here for speed, uh, there's a lot of caching activities that goes on. Let's see if I can get rid of this. And if I want to go and um, actually, I don't see where it is. Let me make sure it's showing up. Well, there's usually a three little dots over here, but there's something else in here that will allow me to actually refresh uh, and clear the cache. So you can force that as well. I'm sure we'll find it later in the uh, demo here as we get through it, but I don't see it right now. But different ways you can to force that. So if you're not seeing, if you're not believing your eyes and think something's right, just clear the cache and, and do a refresh. And a lot of times that will show you different results. Okay. Yeah, another question here. Um, so you've added criteria and results on the screen, but is there something similar to add a filter? Um, your filter, in terms of being able to have that quick drop down, yeah. the answer is no. And this is one of the, I believe that's on the roadmap from what I've heard, is that that quick and dirty, just be able to select from a drop down. Um, as it stands right now, no, there is no quick and dirty. Uh, for that. Uh, I mean, I think that's a huge limitation, just being able to publish out so people can have this data set and then just click on that. Right now, uh, there are a couple ways to do it, though. So if I wanted to um, have a quick filter on, I know I put item in here, didn't I? Item. So I can go directly from my clicking on uh, the three dots of anything I do want to do a filter on. It's not as easy as it was on other things, but you'll notice I do have filter here. But it's not like anything I can just predetermine up in the header. Uh, and I certainly have to be on the data set view in order to do this. And now I can click on, and if I just want to see, uh, again, search so awesome here, BA immediately returns anything. So just these, which is a certain product. So you can do the line, it's just not as easy as it was. And it, again, you have to be in the data set view in order to do this. You cannot do that directly from um, a graph and you can't do that from a pivot table. Margie. Yeah, I actually have, in the presentation, I've got a whole thing on, the question is about uh, limitations. I actually have a section on limitations where I'll, I'll present what I know and then I'll throw it up to the, uh, the audience here to add some of that to it because uh, when it comes to this stuff that's so new, you just don't know what you don't know. Uh, so we'll, we'll certainly address limitations, which there are many. Yeah. So is there a way to do a search like this for, say, a missing field? Like, we didn't put the apartment, and I can search for all transactions of this type using the Yes. So that is, uh, the question is, can we do a search that says all transactions that are meeting this criteria but do not have department? That's something you can just build into your, uh, your basically your, I don't want to call these filters, but your uh, criteria up here or you can say where trans or uh, department equals none. But you gotta remember department is no longer a header field. So you're gonna do that from the transaction line field. Because that's one of those maddening things you're like, oh, it's not working. It's because you've gotta go and build that down at that lower level. Although it looks and feels like it would be a header field because it's up on top in the form. It, in reality, in the data structure, it's not. You're welcome. Yeah, one more question over here. Uh, I have no idea. Um, I'd have to go and look. I mean, I, I can't figure out what the count is. I know Bob and Bob is going down the bottom. 
Yeah. Well, right now, there's a, well, I can tell you, because it's filtered like this, how many are there? There's 111 rows that I'm returning, but all of them have the same value because I just put a filter on here for this is my uh, dream in the wind uh, item. So there's only, yes, well, there's 111 of them. They're all returned to the same thing. So the distinct, there's unique returns is one. And that changes based on which field you have to highlight. Yes. So if I click on transaction line quantity, sum, average, count, and I don't even get a distinct when I'm doing a, a numeric one. Thank you. You're welcome. Over here. I can't remember, but you search under searches or you join. You cannot, at this point, from what I have seen, being able to join multiple workbooks together to perform searches. But because you've got basically limitless access to anything on it, you could theoretically build workbooks within workbooks. Just because I mean I haven't run into a limitation and in, in, you know kind of that bridge too far, uh, I've always been able to get out there. And then every time you go further and further, you're going to get way more results, and you really got to be good at putting in criteria that are limiting down so it's just the data set I want. And so when I'm building these things that get much more complex, I frequently find I find the field that I want, but then I've got to go and add. So it's kind of one. Okay, now let's go and limit that down to just what I want. And you've got to find that separation point in the data to really help you define that. Yeah, you know, where Safe Search, they were doing a lot of that for you. Here you've got to, I mean, that kind of onus is on you. I've got two questions. Um, can you inline edit on this? Question is, can you inline edit? The answer is no. Okay, uh, so Currently. Question, uh, can you use the report results uh, for field value? Like a Safe Search can be the value in a field? Yeah, um, that currently, uh, anything that it does not store value, which the save search, if you're going to set that as, you know, a, a, a custom field where you're going to set the value as a save search, the only way that actually shows up is if you leave that checkbox of store value unchecked. Right. Uh, and because of that, it will not show up uh, as one of the items that we can return here. Because those aren't uh, according to the data structure, I mean, they're, they're a different type of field, really. All right. Um, well, uh, there, there's a Q&A section, you know, at the end of this, but uh, after we've got these built now, I want to go ahead and dive into uh, some of the other things that we can do once we build these data sets. And I've just built a couple others already you know, in preparation for this, so I'm going to uh, switch over to one of those because I think you guys have seen, you know, and on the spot, it's harder to bring in some of these things. Um, but now back, clicking on the analytics tab, I'll make it a little bit bigger. Uh, you can see Rocky Mountain NetSuite user group demo set is now in there as one of my re uh, used workbooks, frequent, recent used, whatever it's called. And now that should be in my workbook somewhere in here. But I got a couple other ones in here uh, that we can look at. Um, so I've got the sales Bible one here. And this is just one that I've prepared uh, ahead of time. And so here you can see I've got date, transaction, brand, customer, transaction types or invoices, you know, what items we're selling. So I built that the exact same way as we've done, uh, we've, we've done before. Uh, now I've got a bunch of different items down here. And I've got a, a couple of pivot charts that I've already created on here. And we'll actually go through how I created this one. So this one's actually bringing in class for you know, what location we have, different items, and some of the information off of our sales information. In order to do that, you know, just from the workbook that we're in, um, it's now gone over here, which if you've got a really long list, this can be hard to find. So just know that your plus is always to the right of anything that you've already built. Uh, Click our plus, and then we can go either add a pivot or add a chart. Now, everything that we're going to be doing here is going to be pulling from the same set of data. So I'll hit add pivot here, and it's going to take me to basically my blank pivot report. All of the fields that are on um, the data set will appear here. Now, one of the downsides is if I went and renamed the column that doesn't that name 
renamed version of it does not translate over. So you'd have to go and rename everywhere through it. Because uh, if I want to take display name here and change this, I absolutely can come in here and rename this to whatever I want. Very similar to what we did. Um, so I display code. Very similar to what we could do in Safe Search. But when I do that, that does not necessarily translate over here, even if I were to refresh this. So if you've got a lot of different things coming, I always will go and try to rename things in terms of where they're coming from. That does me a lot of, I mean, not a lot of good when it comes over here because it's gonna be some trial and error. If you're pulling the same field, but from different tables, because I might be pulling uh, something from a, uh, a transaction that was created after this, and it still has the same uh, quantity field or the same amount field, and you just have to bring them in and find out which ones you actually wanna report on. But those are all going to show up over to the left. Again, we can expand and contract these. Um, but what we're gonna do is we've got rows, and that's basically, you know, what do we want to see from a, a vertical standpoint? Columns, what do we wanna see from a horizontal standpoint? And then different measures. And this just makes it really easy to take uh, any of the things that we wanna report on. So if I wanna go and uh, put items here, and again, we're gonna have that same thing, anything with a parent-child relationship, we're gonna get this. I can go add items here. Um, I wanna go and column headers, I wanna have this by date. And then if I want to see what this is going to result at at any time, I simply hit the refresh button. And that's going to go and source in my data. So here it's blank, but I can see the shell of everything that I've set up. And here's those three dots that I was looking for if you need to clear cache. So it's going to be on the actual uh, charts and, and pivot tables. But now I want to go in and pull in, uh, we've got transaction types, but I want to bring in a uh, dollar amount and quantities. So I'm going to take quantity and just drop it here. And I also want to see uh, amount with that and take it and drop it here. Now on each one of these, you can see, I mean, you've got the ability to go rename what these are. You can create specific filters directly in here. So there's a lot you can do uh, by just clicking on the three dots on all of these. Anytime you see a plus on date, I think this is really nice. If I want to go and say, yeah, I want to see it by date, quarter, eh, I don't necessarily want to be see it by quarter, but I do want to be able to roll this up by month. So I want to see like the year above it and then the month. To me, that would be useful. I can set all of that and that will show me how I'm breaking down kind of my columns up here at the top. So that looks good. If I want to see what that's going to look like, simply hit your refresh button. And now we pulled in items. Let me just zoom out just a tad. Just to get a little more real estate for what we're looking at. Now you'll notice as I scroll up and down, uh, I hate that, right? The, the column here goes away so I can't see what this is resulting. So one of the cool things you have up here is you can actually lock uh, certain things. So this is turning on highlighting, which I think is really useful. I don't know why you'd ever turn it off, just so you can see what you're looking at. Um, but you also have the ability, I think it's this one, to um, pick this one, freeze row headers and free column he headers. And so if I wanna be able to scroll left to right without losing this one, just click that. So now I can use this much like Excel and lock those things and be able to go in and, and examine this. Now you'll see one, two, three, four, five, these are months, they just re return in uh, you know, the month of the year. And then you've got your year up here, 2019 to 12, and then we're into 2020. So you, I don't know if you can make, there is a little break there, you know, in terms of how this is displaying, uh, and then one. So I can see that what I sold this year, I can see I sold eight of those, you know, and a hundred of these. And you can just keep going back and forth to defining exactly what these are in terms of how we want to report on these. Now, once you've saved that, I mean, basically come in here, and save it. But one of the downsides and one of the limitations that really stinks is, yeah, that's great. I can go and I'll show you how we can use some of these reports that we're building here, but I can't just create a copy of that. 
and utilize all of this base because I could put some filters on or anything else. So this is for all. If I want to create like an item specific version of this, I've got to go and click plus and start that process all over again of building this out, putting a filter, saving that, and then go build another one. So you do not have the, while well, you have the ability of, of copying by doing a save as of an entire workbook, you do not have the ability to copy uh, and then make you know, minor changes to uh, charts or uh, uh, pivot chart or uh, pivot tables. So you really got to go one for one. I mean, to me, that's just a huge pain in the butt type of thing. I like to think they're working on that and that will become a feature. But as it stands now, uh, especially if you're building out specific, some of, you know, some of these, and you'll see it's really powerful what you can do. But because you don't have that filter capability, you really have to build out each one of these. It's not like I could build uh, the pivot chart and then just be like, show me uh, sales by sales rep for an item and just being able to select you know, from two drop down filters, that just doesn't exist yet. You've got really got to build uh, each one of these specifically. Uh, some other things uh, to mention here, uh, in terms of what these are resulting, it's taking that data set. Again, everything spawns from the data set. And then you can determine how this is actually showing up. So very similar to what we'd see on most pivot charts here. I can determine if we're going to be summing those values uh, using medians, counts, min, max. Um, one of the other cool things, I guess you can't do it here, but you can certainly do it on your data set, um, especially if you're in a multi-currency environment and you want to be able to convert, uh, for example, this uh, amount net. If I want to, on anything that's a currency field, you're going to have this currency ability here to where I can actually apply conversions directly to this data set to make sure I'm understanding how I'm reporting this. So here I can go and actually want to report that in Canadian dollars, Euro, British pounds, however, and it will convert that and all my reporting will be in the appropriate uh, currency, regardless of base currencies or anything else like that. And again, you have to set that on the data set to be able to report on it with our uh, pivot names here. But through this, we can go in and, you know, I've got some preset one sales by items. And again, so you can see I've got class location and item here. That's because class location and item are here. If I want to change the hierarchy of how that's being reported, click on this and I'm going to put location first, drag this up and refresh it. And it's going to show exactly that hierarchy now. <laughs> So to me, this is really easy to use, although there are limitations, but it's really easy to go and kind of modify to make sure I'm getting this report exactly the way I want to see it. Columns, and again, you can expand quarter, month, all the way down to date, individual dates. And this will, I'm not going to run this here because it's going to show a really, really, really long list of basically sales by day with that hierarchy all built into it. And if you want to get rid of them, simply click on the trash. So this is just reflecting all that same information. This one, I've just brought in some additional information. So let me collapse this down here. If we're really looking at sales, we want to look at, uh, you know, with credit memos. So you can see all of what we're actually selling by each one of these, including journal entries for revenue in case they were associated with it. And grand totals and everything else. And how do we get to those grand totals? Uh, I showed, well, this is uh, the highlighting. And you can see, depending on where your mouse is, you can highlight spots of the results to the right. But you turn that off, that will uh, turn that off. Uh, you can do the same thing with columns. So, of where I'm doing it. And then um, there's columns on. And then we showed the freeze rows. Now, you got to be careful with this, especially if you have a lot of crate area over here because it will show all of the criteria basically anything that's showing up um, in your row section here are going to be frozen so i recommend getting a bigger screen if you're going to do a lot of that because that's just really really small um, and then column headers so if i were to scroll down you can see our headers go away a lot of these things are i just set and forget and then put it in compact mode to me it doesn't do a whole lot more but 
it's reloading and I just put all of this. Well, I think it's come off. But this will collapse things down just to make it uh, a little bit more screen sensitive for what you have. But if, when it comes to, I'll just come up. Like I said, it doesn't look like a whole lot smaller than what we had originally. But if we want to go, as this is running, if we want to add different sums in here, uh, so basically subtotals or anything else, we can determine what do we want to total from a column's point of view, a row's point of view. And you can do uh, these holistically, or we can go and actually set individually. And all this does is this is going to do everything. Everything that we're returning here. Do I want to do it hide, which means don't show it? Do I want to put it on the left, put it on the right? And if I do want to set each of those specifically, I can say how I, where I want multiple use for showing them differently, but uh, you know, you certainly have got the capability of doing so. I don't know if I'd ever want to see a sum on the left and one on the right. I can definitely see hiding one and not showing another, but but you're able to, to dictate exactly how that's going to show up. So, and I built a couple others just off the same data set. So if we go into sales by customer, I'm getting, so we have a system gets turning and turning and turning. And I found out it's much faster just to go and starting over. You can see how much more responsive it is now than it was. Probably should clear cash. Uh, um, Apply. on has all of those you just have to wait I know they're doing lots of things just to improve speed a lot of those uh, if it's taken a long time and you can add filters to reduce it by all means do that but that's about all that you can do other than going to uh, kind of your own private uh, server where you're gonna have all the resources and you know of course that comes with additional cost Jerry, there's a question online. question online uh, how do I know which month if I'm not on a calendar view? I believe one is always January, regardless of your fiscal calendar. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't say January 2020 or January 2020. Like it only show the month, it won't show the year of that month as well. Correct. And I have, I haven't seen, or I, I guess I haven't even tried you know, kind of fiscal reporting, but all of the date filtering that I've seen on this is. I mean, one is always January, the year is always 2020. I mean, it's just, it's always that structure. Now you can apply other filters to try to, you know, segregate those a little bit, but from the standard, just pivoting um, functionality, it's always based on the natural calendar year. So here's just a different view, some of the same ones. You can see we're going down to quarters, but this is sales by customer. Again, we got customer, then specifically sales rep, and then do our transactions. Um, Within our charting structure itself, this one's useful. Uh, we've also got these pluses and minuses, which uh, we didn't necessarily have in uh, save searches or anything, but if I wanna collapse this, just to show all of my results by uh, customer, if you hit the minus here, so now it's collapsed all these to where I can see without all of the individual detail. And then on any of these, if we want to go and export these down to Excel, you can do that. Although there's a lot less need now to go down to Excel because you can do all your reporting uh, on these directly from here. And then you can on the fly, again, go and apply different sorting. Although by default, it's kind of earliest date to latest date. But a lot of different features to be able to go and make sure you get that data exactly the way you want. And once we get, uh, you know, I mean, that's kind of the uh, um, the pivot aspects of this. 
but we also have the ability to go and create charts directly from here. So we're gonna have our chart. And again, if you can't find this, it's presented all the way over to the right. Probably should have put that over to the left or something like that, but let's see if that changes. So this is gonna bring us to our blank chart. And it's very similar. Uh, I like the fact that they made it very similar to your pivot table uh, where we've got different accesses and series. So if I wanna go and see date down here, and I wanna make sure that we're reporting on um, items is going to be our series and we want to see um, amounts just drag these in here click refresh and that will create our chart now you can see the date it's going to be combining everything by year we've got that same ability to kind of explode those things and here's my uh, resulting chart if I want to add um, additional information or uh, expand this out and show it by quarter, simply add that there and refresh this. And we should see now a larger breakdown. So really easy, got charting capabilities that you didn't have before. So in addition to that, you can see I've, I under the layout here, I can select a column chart or any other chart. So seven different charting options. You'll notice there's no pie chart. I thought that was a, no, I mean, to me, that's a really logical one. And with all the different charts out there today, I mean, I'd love to see like radar charts because I mean, this, you could see the, the, the promise of this, but right now having, I mean, basically there's one chart type. They're just showing that chart type in like a different format. Um, <laughs> I mean, because a line chart, I mean, if I want to see this as a line chart, I mean, it's this is going to be the same data. It's just going to be squiggly lines. Um, but you do have the ability to uh, roll over and see what all the values are for each one of these. And I do believe that this is just going to get better and better and better over time as, uh, you know, additional, uh, you know, charting options and stuff come in. So here's our line chart. I guess that one doesn't show nearly as well. Um, column chart here is quite useful as we go some of our use cases. We'll jump into that, but being able to show kind of the different totals and seeing how things have changed in terms of sales. We had a big jump in sales and being able to see exactly what the makeup is of each of these. So again, very easy to go, change. Uh, you cannot copy them, so I can't just, I wanna take this one, but make a minor tweak and save that. I really have to start with the clicking the plus and build that, uh, you know, basically from the start. Use in the same workbook, using the same, uh, a data set, but it's going to have to start each one of them from uh, the ground up. And then we've just got some other ones in here, sales by sales reps, just some other use cases. Sales over time. So a lot we can do with, you know, building out these kind of standard charts. And with that, I say we, it seems like a natural break right now. So we'd covered that. We did our introductions. Oops, don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Um, so next, when we come back, I'll, you know, let's take a quick five-minute break. Um, then we'll jump back into some of the standard workbooks, things to get you going. Um, then we'll get into uh, some of those practical use cases. All right, everybody online, we're going to get going now. So with all of this, this the whole kind of new way of doing it, you know, everything, uh, NetSuite has showed pity upon us and they have published out, as I mentioned a little bit before, um, a bunch of standard uh, workbooks, which to me are kind of starting points. Um, so these are all pre-existing data sets that they've kind of built for us. Some of them are custom, like I, I mentioned, you know, that, and we'll go into one of these here, but uh, some of those fields that had disappeared that were not available in 219.2 uh, uh, have miraculously made a comeback um, just because some of these things were so hard to get to. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of new launching off points. Uh, 
So some of them are these custom data models that have been built by NetSuite for us, you know, stuff that we don't have the ability to do, but uh, some of those pre-existing connections they've gone and made for some of us in some of these analytical workbooks, as we saw that there were three of them uh, available to us now. Um, each of these includes sample pivot tables, sample charts, so it really helps us, you know, kind of get going, uh, and we can use these as a really start, you know, strong jumping off point. And so the current standard workbooks that they have are listed here, uh, and I won't spend time going through each and every one of these, but uh, let's jump in. So to get to those standard workbooks, again, click on our analytics uh, menu here, and down here at the very bottom, we're gonna have standard workbooks. Now you guys should all see the same things I'm seeing here. We've got, uh, you know, for if we care specifically about time, we've got time uh, manufacturing workbook. You're gonna see that this is, the root record of this is not a root record at all. It's actually one of these custom data models that they've built for us. Uh, purchases, so we got some good stuff on the AP and uh, procurement side of things. We've got uh, sales, both for invoiced as well as sales orders, depending on how, uh, if you look at bookings versus revenue. System notes, and you can see this one's already a version two workbook. I don't know how bad version one was to have this updated already. Um, transaction detail workbook, again, some of these things have already been built with some of those connections. So as opposed to st starting from scratch, you can jump in here, although I really recommend jumping in and really kind of playing with some of these things yourselves and making sure you understand how all these links are being made. Uh, so you can, and these are going to have certain limitations to them. That's just, if it's a, its own uh, kind of data set. And then some other stuff around warehouse. But one of the ones I do want to focus on is you can see there's three of these that are very specifically sales, um, you know, and these the analytical records. So if I go into the manufacturing workbook and I want to use that as my jumping off point, I can simply click on that. And that's going to take me right into that preset data model. So you can see I've got a series of items that have already been added here. You're going to notice this is really reduced here on the left hand side in terms of the number of joined records. So um, which typically to me means there's gonna be lots of limitations with this. But you're gonna see, and this is, um, you can see this little one that doesn't exist if you go to any transaction search or as your basis, you're never gonna see this thing called built. But some of these things that went away that are just, I mean, they're basically one of these values that was basically being collected of anything that was built from any child transaction, NetSuite has kind of recreated to make it easy to, to go and do some of the things that we used to do. So these are all great because if I go through here, not only I've got a preset one and the same rules apply to these as they do starting from scratch, uh, whatever is highlighted here, these are going to be showing all of the fields. And you'll notice just on manufacturing transaction, I'm at the bottom of the list here. I mean, there is not a whole lot to be able to be selected here, although it has built, which could be hugely important to you. And then the ones that are gonna show blue are the ones that are, have already been added into your uh, uh, results over here on the right hand side. Uh, they all come with pre-built um, criteria established for you. So it's just a really good jumping off point to go and, uh, you know, start with some of these. And then they're going to have specific pivot uh, tables already built for you. So again, frameworks of what you can use and you can go and study if you like something on how that's set up really you can really look and see how that was established here and go create something on your own if this one's not going to meet your needs but these are great because they're i mean they're really practical use things if i want to see production production cost by period by assembly you know that one's pre-built for you total production cost by month median unit costs and you're able to keep going to the right here, but production cost by quarter by location, just great use case examples uh, that you can go and really understand, hey, that's really, I, I could see the value in that and I wanna to try to recreate that for myself. Um, I mean, they're just great examples. So that's my manufacturing workbook. Other standard workbooks, like the one based off of invoices, again, I think these are somewhat limited, but they're great starting points. So you can see just the sheer amount of what I can actually join has been reduced down. But I've got a lot of great data sets and stuff in here already. To be 
able to go and just build upon these. And so here they got sales by customer, sales rep, sales over time. Uh, it looks like that one that I uh, was showing earlier, I actually started from one of these bases and kind of build you know, from that going forward. Um, just another tip is you, know, you can always bring in like transaction ID and all kinds of other stuff. But when you actually bring in the field called transaction, as you can see here, you're going to have the hyperlink that you can go directly from that. Not every field has it because I could have brought document ID or um, we do not want to make these changes. Thank you, Oracle. Um, same thing for customers. I mean, you can return different versions of customer or something from the, like the customer name. Not all of them are going to give you the hyperlink. So definitely do the ones that are going to. Um, same thing with, with item. So I could have brought in name from the item record. However, if I bring it from the main line of uh, this transaction, it'll give me that hyperlink. So I'll leave this. And then from a starting point from the transaction, if you're not comfortable with kind of building those joins yourself, uh, it's built off the standard transaction one. Uh, but this transaction detailed workbook Again, if you're not comfortable kind of going at this is going to have all of those predetermined um, joins built into the results already. And so we can see you know, that we're pulling all transactions at this point. But the amounts, you can see these are varying, which means we're pulling from the individual line items. And so we can start from there. But even with these, and this is from the transaction data set, so You've got the ability, you've got the full list on these. It's only going to be on those analytical workbooks that you're going to be constrained. So I highly recommend just kind of jumping in there and, and kind of experimenting with yourself to see, you know, it's, it's like a, a, you know, a report within NetSuite. You kind of find the report that's closest to what you want and start kind of modifying from there. Uh, I'd recommend starting into this kind of with that same kind of approach. So now let's just jump into some practical use cases because there used to be a lot of uh, just difficult solutions to be able to come up with in an automated fashion with NetSuite that through the use of this, although young, uh, we've been able to accomplish. And so, uh, you know, from our organization, um, we've enabled to, or we've, this has enabled us to really get some additional cost breakdowns so of just views into, uh, you know, our individual costs that we never had the ability to do before. Uh, in terms of yield calculations, if you've got, if you're manufacturing something that's going into something that's going, in, you know, and it's kind of going down, being able to go in and determine, you know, where are those losses coming from and being able to uh, take a look at that on an item by item basis. Uh, we built out searches that show inventory on a future date. Uh, so I can go and see on a specific day what my anticipated inventory is going to be. And that's based on sales orders, expected depletions with expect, expected additions from uh, coming in from production orders or purchase orders, whatever. Well, you know, what have you, but to be able to see what I have actually available to sell very easily on a, um, you know, daily basis. There is a limitation to do weekly, which kind of stinks. Um, you know, I, we think we can probably get around that eventually, but there's, uh, as we'll talk about the, in the limitations, there's just some other things that, uh, some SQL functions that just aren't available that used to be available in Safe Search. Um, one of the best things is the visualization of data. Uh, you know, if you're doing any kind of quality control data or anything where you want to see, you know, you know, statistical changes or, you know, being able to, to take a look at over, you know, very long time periods, that's great. If you look at that data, it's really hard to pick those things out. But with the data visualization, you can do a lot of stuff with that. Uh, and that kind of flows in with if you're trying to tie in um, different systems. Uh, we now have this great reporting and visualization tool, uh, although somewhat limited, but it's still better than most of these SCADA systems or uh, PLC systems that we have out there. But now we're doing more and more bringing that data in. And once we get it within NetSuite, and then there's basically limitless what we can do with it and how we can actually view that data. So I'll go into a couple of them here. So for my analytics, I'm going to go into Let's do this cost component per barrel. 
So what this is, is this particular account here, uh, this is a demo account we use specifically for one of our products, Crafted ERP, which is a batch manufacturing you know, industry specific solution. And uh, one of the things that we were trying to solve here is uh, when people look at their product, you know, it's great. We've got, you know, 15 different components that go into it, but I want to look at things in kind of buckets and where's my cost really coming from? How do I, you know, how do I take actions that can make me more profitable in terms of, of you know, what we're actually selling? And so this one, I started from our manufacturing um, workbook. So you can see this one's limited down, but that was the basis from which I started this one. And I've got a series of, you know, I'm only pulling in uh, production orders. Um, I only want to look two years in the past. Um, I only want to look at stuff that's liquid. In this particular case, we manufacture liquid and we package it and sell it as a, as a different item. But I'm really only focused at this point on the, you know, that portion of my manufacturing. Um, I'm Mainline is false. And by the way, it's going to trick you. Mainline is always on the transaction line. It seems weird, but you will not find it if you click on up here. You know, up here, it's never going to show up. You've got to go down into the transaction line. It's counterintuitive, I know, but uh, don't make that mistake. Learn from me. Um, and then we're looking for uh, you know, removing uh, lines that are work order completion scrap. We don't care about that. And then don't care about lines that have zero GL impact. So we've established all of that. And then from here, let me collapse this a little bit. You can see my data set where I'm pulling in the actual transaction, which particular batch that relates to what particular recipe we're manufacturing, start date, end date information. Uh, again, built, it's such a beautiful thing, but all of those things that, that we actually manufactured uh, showing up here. And then all of the related transactions to this. Um, so this here I'm pulling in all of these, and they're not actually called related transactions anymore. So in order to get to those just from here, we go to transaction. And then going down here, you can actually go to linked transactions. They're somewhere down here. But this is where you can go from a production order down to some of those other, and I guess uh, um, that were created from this or related. It used to be the most confusing thing in NetSuite. I still couldn't give you the definition between applying or applied to. I don't know if you, I always had to add both to find out which one I wanted and then get rid of the other one. Um, here, if I could find it, it's, it is better explained uh, where it's like down or up or previous or prior or something like that. It's, it is better explained. Um, but this is, this is where I pulled this from. So transactions that were created for my production order, you know, what specific transaction line type, again, you've got to pull specifically from um, the line transactions, but now I'm pulling it from this related transaction one. So again, I'm like four or five different layers deep down in order to grab this information. Being able to categorize what that component was, because I want to be able to return things, not this is way too much detail. Uh, so I want to just like uh, this particular uh, labor item, I just want to report as labor for this. So being able to do kind of, um, you know, dissociate uh, many of these to one of these. And I've got quantities, and this is coming from the transaction line item of the related transaction. So again, now we're like six levels deep uh, through this whole thing. And then bringing out individual cost that was related to that, um, our component cost. And then uh, we've got cost per barrel. And I didn't cover this earlier, I should have, but uh, I can do it now. That cost per barrel, if I click on formulas here, this is gonna show me all of my formulas that I can use here. And if I wanna create a new formula, click on new formula. We can title this whatever we want. What is our output going to be? It used to be you had to search on the safe search. You'd had to pick formula, text, formula, numeric, things like that. Here we can establish exactly what this is going to be in much more of a native, native, or SQL native aspect of it. And then our formula. And so if I wanted to take, uh, you know, you can do all your case when statements, anything else that we want to put in here. It can be as simple as clicking on, double clicking these will bring these in. You're going to notice we've got transaction. And now we've got our um, pound split here. because so that's how it's returning. I mean, so you're gonna see some diff different things. So you can't just take old save search formulas 
and plug them in here, you really have to rebuild them again because that would have just said uh, transaction in the uh, safe search view of things. But that transaction actually has a transaction number, it has the transaction display, and so this is going to result, if I was going to say like uh, I only want to show, I'd be like case when, from here is like equals sales order because it's that's the display name of what I'm looking at. So it takes a little bit of time, but not too much to be able to kind of navigate through some of those, those differences. But uh, one of the great things, so if I want to do, just put quantity down here and I'll just do a, a simple plus zero. But once I get my uh, formula built out, I can click the validate button. And it says, ah, the output is set to integer, but it's going to return to float. So I can say, okay, I'm going to actually set this to float because that's really not an integer. That could be, uh, you know, quantities could be decimals or anything else. And so decimals now float, uh, but you can validate. In fact, you have to validate that before you can actually add this to your data set. Um, some other great tools through here, you can go and through that entire tree on the left-hand side, and these actually indent a little bit nicer for you. You can see where I'm pulling any of this stuff from. And this is actually my data set. So if I want to go and say, you can see how many levels deep I actually got with this particular one, where I'm actually pulling sub item from an item coming from a transaction line that's from the related transaction to the original transaction that rolls up to the ultimate transaction that I'm searching on. But here, clicking on this, now I'm going to that particular record and I'm on the basically the item record and I can pull from any of these. Now, this is one of the coolest things is you can see this little carrot here on how many different links that I'm doing with this to try to see exactly which data point I'm actually pulling. So where it used to be you've got like, you know, record dot something, we now have this record caret record dot something dot something dot something dot something caret. I mean, it's it's gotten a lot more complex, but hugely valuable to do things that we never could do before without scripting. And then once you save those, you're, they're going to come, and I know I didn't save that one, but you're going to see that when I click on formulas, they're going to come here where I can actually go and drag this in and use that formula as a criteria. It, that used to be the biggest pain in my butt on, say, searches is trying to build in you know, some of these more complex things as actually criteria. But now I can just simply drag it and put it where I wanted to up in my trans uh, here, and I can drag it and add it to my data set. You can see cost per barrel is already there because it's turned blue just like everything else. But now I've got all this great information pulled from the depths of NetSuite. Um, you know, how do I want to use that? And so on this particular one, I went and created a pivot table. That's not the one I want, though. So let's go to this pivot table. And here you can see I'm basically sorting by individual recipes, then individual batch information, all the way down to individual transactions, and then the items. So I'm able to go and basically see my breakdown on a recipe, on a batch, however I want to view this, but by these big four categories, even though there's 20 odd components going in here, I can see how much of that is labor, how much is grain, overhead hops, and then how does that relate into my cost per unit? So my cost per barrel. And so my for that particular production order, this is what it went into inventory at. Um, and then how is that breakdown? So where can I save? Where you know, are my costs really coming from front any of these? This gives us so much more visibility into what's actually going on, where our costs coming from. Uh, and this was something specifically on like distillery sides that was hugely important because especially when you have like these concepts of aging something for five years and all of the costs that we want actually allocate and associated with that production. How do we grab that? How do we get in the system? Then more importantly, how do we, how do we report on it? And without the uh, analytics uh, workbooks, it was previously impossible because we just couldn't reach down into those depths of all this information. And so now we've got all of this that's just great to have, but you know, is it useful? Yeah, is it as useful as if I'm able to chart that though? Probably not. So I've got a chart here that we've created that will graphically show one particular 
So you can see I've got a filter applied, so I'm only looking at my dream in the wind, particular style of beer, and then my cost breakdown for every production order I've done. And guess what shows up here? I mean, now, whoa, what's that? And again, I got the hover, why do I have $527 per barrel that I produced of that of labor? And you know, chances are there's an error or something else in there, but now I can start digging into these things. This gives me visibility I never had in the NetSuite before. So that's one use case. Um, and I know we're running a little bit out of time. I wanna make sure we have some time. So uh, I guess we'll leave that at that one and we'll come over to specific limitations. Uh, what I found so far, and again, I'm, I am not the end all be all, but uh, no analytics functions. So there's that SQL function sum, uh, you, which was pivotal if you're gonna do any kind of running total in a search you know, that's adding the previous line and to get that uh, does not exist here. Uh, it just, it's not there. It's, you can't do that. So uh, that to me was kind of a, a bit of a letdown because that just allowed us with safe search to go and really expand, you know, what we're able to do with that. Uh, and so none of those analytic functions currently exist in there. If you've got any kind of ad uh, blockers, pop-up blockers, anything else, you might not render things right. You might not know why. You gotta make sure you disable those or make sure that NetSuite is like the safe zone. Um, for those otherwise, you know, um, the rendering of pivot tables and charts might not occur accurately. You might not know why. Uh, limited chart formats, we kind of talk about this. Um, a pie chart would be great. Um, and then there's lots of other things that if you go to like the uh, Google API in terms of different charts that are available, I'd like to see a lot more of those in there. Um, on my charts, I can't select the colors. I can't go and pick, it's it, the system picks it for you. Um, so if I come back here, I mean, I'm happy that they're UCLA colors, but I didn't actually get to pick those. Um, no multi-access. So just a, let's do another use case here real quick. Um, let me just hmm, the quality tab here. So I mentioned like just the visualization of data stuff. Um, you know, here I can see the various, you know, whatever it is, this is particular gravity as it relates to a particular tank in terms of what our readings are. Uh, another use case of graphing quality control data. Um, we did a built a use case in here where certain of our beers weren't, you know, achieving the sensory they were supposed to. And this chart immediately shows why, and we can tie this back to specific lots of grain that we were using that didn't meet code or spec as they were when they were brought in. But my issue here is this is where we can have multiple lines. And this is all using the same you know, bits of information here. And let me just open the workbook for this one. Is I can only have a single access. I cannot have another access over here. So, uh, you know, temperature or gravity, which is gonna be a much smaller number than temperature, I, mean, I just got this big discrepancy. I don't get to see all of the fluctuation that I'd like to see in a graph like this. So this is a limitation to me of not being able to establish a kind of a secondary scale. Uh, right now we're limited to the single scale that we have over on the left-hand side. That's great, thank you. I actually did not know we could do that. So um, yeah, so we can see that, but again, it's hard to overlay one over the other, but right. yes. Um, and I guess one of the things I didn't show, if I just uh, if come to any specific tab, um, if you go to personalize on any of these, and I don't know if this one will have it, but uh, you will see the analytics in here. So this is a custom tab. So if I edit custom tab, you can go and add additional um, content to these. So by going into portlets and then adding analytics, I think you can add up to 10 uh, on any of these. And then any of those pivot tables or charts that you have in there, So this is now added to my analytics portlet down here. Let's move this guy up out of the way. Come into setup, and then you can see everything that I have in all of my workbooks 
I can select and bring into a dashboard. And so this is new for 19.2. Um, you used to not be able to do charts or pivot, one of the two, but you can do it both now. So that's all that really matters. But if I want to bring that production cost or let's see here, variance. sales by item report whatever the case is bring it in here and again very similar you can set top tens other things um, but this will bring in all any of all of those reports directly to dashboards and so you can bring all these in same thing with anything with dashboards publish these out so people are all looking at the uh, uh, the same bit of information I know on this quality one we've got a bunch of those already established that's exactly how we got all of these onto the dashboard So all of this information is actually coming from a custom record, which is associated with a batch, which is associated with a tank. So if I go into one of my particular tanks here, on our quality control, we can see exactly where all that information is being generated from. So I'm just simply graphing that information as it relates to that particular batch. So that, oops, let's go back here. So that multi-access, you know, it looks like there's some kind of workarounds, but it would be nice to be able to see and be able to set all those. Currently no zero support for lot or serial numbers. So if you're trying to get down to you know, that additional thing, not gonna happen. If you even if you go into the start and new workbook, where typically you'd see like inventory detail or uh, um, item lot detail, I can't remember the name of those, they just don't exist in there. I mean, you can't even see them. Uh, there's other missing tables, and again, I don't know what I don't know, but I know there's other things that I've been looking for. I just didn't write them down. Um, you can't use any kind of image fields or um, on some of the other you know, things with safe searches. You could actually bring things in like this, where you could actually show an image of you know, different things in the safe search. You just don't, you can't do that here. So uh, again, add that onto our wish list. Um, and then we mentioned a little bit before that uh, any custom field, you have to store value in order to be able to utilize that in a data set. So uh, other than that you found this class was boring, I want to throw it out to you is what other limitations can we go and kind of associate here? Because anybody? Yes, Margie, I figured you had one. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so for the guys on the phone, the two additional limitations, uh, number one is you can't export the pivot table in the its current format. It's only the data set you can actually export. And two, when you resize columns, it's it's not sticky. It gets reset every time you come back to it, which of course can be annoying. The system notes table is not there, but you can actually, there is a system notes search you can do and you start from system notes and you can go backwards into the transactions. It seems weird, but anything else? There's a question online, Jeremy. She asked if, um, can we look at the teacher inventory workbook? Um, can you just show it real quick, I guess? Is that one of the workbooks that it's I don't have it in this, and that was built for a specific customer, so oh, I I'm, I'm not gonna have the ability to jump into that one. Okay, um, and then, uh, well, there's another site, you know, well, we'll file file. Any other limitations that you guys have run into? Again, just a show of hands, have, have any of you guys used this, got in there and played with this yet? And so probably 30% right, hands raised, okay. Um, as previously mentioned, working with a large data set is painfully slow. Refresh. Yes, uh, I would add that to the limitation, large data uh, equals very slow. Um, and that's gonna be slow not only to refresh the data set, but to do any kind of charting or anything else on that is going to be, uh, laboriously slow. All right. Well, the, my final thoughts anyway. Uh, so I, 
I love where this is going. I really do think it's a good start. Um, I mean, the, the multi joins has enabled us to do things that we could never do before. Um, incredible new insight into data. Um, you know, it's better graphing. I mean, you, before you couldn't ever graph like a, I mean, you could only do graphs off reports unless you did that terrible one. I, they should just get rid of it. You know, I'm talking about the uh, save search report where you view results in the graphical. I mean, it was just god awful ugly. It's It did a disservice to the product, I think. Uh, so we do have better graphing now. I mean, I'd like to see that uh, enhanced. Uh, it definitely feels like a young product. I mean, there's certain things that you would just expect being net sweet in terms of how other things work, that things would work the same way. I think a lot of these things are coming. Uh, I'd like to see that, like the uh, copy graph, copy uh, pivot table type of thing. That seems to me like a really easy thing to be able to do, but I do think there's a lot of room for improvement there. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the next version because each, at least from my experimentation with it, it's gotten better and better. Uh, so if I were to grade this all on the uh, my scale of net sweet, which is not sweet, which there's certainly lots of features in NetSuite that are not sweet, to totally sweet, I think this is pretty sweet. <laughs> and we got uh, just a few minutes left here, so I'll open it up to any additional Q&A. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Um, you've demonstrated a lot of stuff, criteria results, and filters. Are you able to do line highlighting, like text highlighting, like you do on save search? The value between a certain range comes in red. So the question is, can we do any conditional highlighting um, like we can do in a traditional save search? I do not believe that's the case. I have not seen that capability yet. But again, that's, this is one of those great things that you just kind of expect. I mean, they, it seems like a step back in some aspects to not have some of those capabilities, but I have not seen that capability yet. Back. So the question is, can we use sweet scripts to utilize and use utilize these workbooks and sweet scripts? And the answer is yes. Corey. Um, have you seen anything with um, sales pipeline or opportunity that you can access with workbooks yet? I, I, I'm not sure if you could act, you know, run it through transactions or there's no opportunities workbook type that I could see. Or for that yeah, because opportunities is its own thing. Right. Yeah, apparently not. I mean, that's one of those others. There's just certain records that just haven't been enabled for this. I would imagine that those are all coming because um, the idea behind this is to just expose everything and give everything in just in its raw format. But um, obviously how the NetSuite product has adapted and changed over time has created limitations with how we report on in the future because that was one of those things where they bolted on a CRM pretty quickly uh, to be able to compete with others you know, in the marketplace and um, they might not have been as thoroughly thought out in terms of how that product's going to go. And I think the same thing is very true with lot numbering. Um, it wasn't necessarily the best thought out solution. Uh, it's one that we're all stuck with at this point, but we've got to find different ways to be able to report on that and try to have a more standardized uh, reporting model. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. Um, we're having trouble getting the standard workbooks showing up in the admin features that some people don't find that obviously you can access right now. Straightforward, so say again. Um, what I, just create a copy of those because on some of those, if they're not showing up, um, let me go back to my analytics here. Immediately take a, one of these standards because you cannot save over these. So if I go and try to save as here, or save, I can't, I can only do a save as. So save as something else and then immediately share it if you wanna get those out to everybody. Okay. Speaking of sharing, when you're sharing this with somebody, let's say an owner that gets into NetSuite but they're not a great user, what's the best way to share it to where they don't have to see this interface where they might be able to see just a number of the results of a search that they're used to seeing. How would you share that? Dashboards. Publish Dashboards that result out to a dashboard. Yep. Okay. Otherwise, yeah, I mean, if you've got, because anything from a dashboard we can uh, immediately jump into, because you can go to the go to workbook, but if you just want to show the results, 
other than the dashboard, the only other way to view it is directly from a workbook. So no sense of emailing the results out. On not the not yet. Of yeah, not like the safe search again, where you can set those and to fire off on certain things. Like there's none of those triggers or anything that are currently included in this. All right. Well, congratulations, all. You've completed your course. Uh, if you guys do have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out uh, to myself or you know any of the other kind of uh, partners in the room. There certainly are plentiful. And for those of you that are looking for your CPE, uh, the code is charts. And that is it for me. So thank you very much. Thank you, Corey. Well, I may just have to show like that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go through a uh, tip and trick um, real quick. And this actually ties into something that, um, that Jeremy said on his um, one of his last slides, uh, tips. He said that if you are going to pull in a custom field onto, uh, into a workbook, that field has to have, a, have the value stored in it. And so um, just to expand on that a little bit, basically, if you have um, a, a save search that's doing a calculation on a field, you can use that calculation on a record um, in a custom field. So anytime you load that record, the um, save search calculation will happen and it'll pull in the value that applies to that record. And so what I'm gonna do is show you how to take that value um, in a non-stored field and basically create a stored field value from that process. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm sorry about this. I don't know what, I, I can't get this to go. So I, I have to actually navigate from over here. I don't know why that's not, maybe I'll, I'll stop presenting for a second because that's not gonna work. Boy, this technology today is killing me. Hmm. I can't even see the buttons to stop sharing here. Come on now. Wow. Sorry, give me just one second. I got to figure out how to get rid of it, how to fix this. There we go. Okay. All right. So the purpose is to use a save search to calculate a value dynamically. Um, the problem is, is that creating only one field for the calculation does not store the value on that record, like we just talked about. Um, a non-stored value cannot be used in reports, save searches, uh, workbooks or exported out of NetSuite. So the the goal of using the power of a safe search to, to do a calculation and then be able to have that data available somewhere else, that's what we're talking about here. That's what we're gonna try and achieve. So here's some basic use cases. Um, we can calculate the sales history by time frame on items. Um, so you could say, I wanna see all the sales for this item in the last 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. So imagine visually you have a field on an item record that says uh, previous 30 days, previous 60 days, previous 90 days. So you could do a dynamic calculation that'll populate those fields when you load the record in NetSuite. But if you try and pull those fields into a safe search or a report, that's, that data is not available because it's being calculated, calculated dynamically. So what we're gonna do is basically um, there's a, a process that we walk through that helps you actually store the values on those fields, okay? Uh, a couple of other use cases, you could calculate the customer sales in a given time frame, create a custom field on the sales, on the customer record to say how much they've um, shown in sales in the last uh, 30, 60, 90, one year, whatever it is. Um, and then I actually have a, a client that I just encountered this with. Um, they wanna calculate the actual sales um, related to opportunities. So they have a custom field on their opportunity and they want to see all of the invoices, all of the sales orders that are pending fulfillment or pending billing and add all of those totals together um, to see how much, you know, how many sales have come from that specific opportunity. 
So um, this is the four-step process. So this is the, um, if, if you can read this and know exactly what to do, then all you need to do is read this. Um, but then I have some slides that'll go through each of the steps one by one. So the first step is to create a safe search with one result that is the value that you want to store in the records. So this result can be a, a summary or a formula or basically anything that you want. Um, on the available filters, you set the internal ID, uh, you set to the internal ID of this item. I'll, I'll go through and show this. Um, this step two is to create two custom fields um, that are basically the same thing. One field is going to have a stored value. The other field is going to have a non-stored value. Okay. Um, and then we'll I'll show you the details on that. Step three, you're going to create another safe search that's going to define the records that you want to update. So let's say you want to update every one of the items that you have in your system, then your safe search would just say maybe all items that are not inactive. Okay, so then it'll just run on all of those items. Um, you could also say, I want to, I want this to run on all customer records um, that are customers within the last year or customers of a specific salesperson or whatever you want to do. So that safe search is going to define the records you're going to update. And then the third or the fourth step is you're going to create a workflow. Um, the trigger on the saves on the workflow is going to be the safe search that you create in step three. So the, that's going to define when the workflow runs. The action is going to set the value of the store value field defined in step two. And then the source of that field is going to be from the other non-value stored field, the, the calculated field. Okay. So um, I, the requirements here, you, you need to have a little bit of a knowledge of safe searches and custom fields and workflows. Um, if you haven't done work with any of these before, you, you need to have a basic understanding, but a basic skill level is okay to be able to accomplish this. Um, the safe searches and the workflow all need to be of the same record type. Um, and that record type is going to be the one that contains the fields that are going to be created. So let's say um, you want to save you're creating fields on an item record. Well, your workflow or your save searches can't be on transactions. They have to start with an item record or with an item search, and then you have to pull to the, from the transactions that are related to that item, okay? So everything has to be of the same record type. Um, and then the custom fields need to be of the same type. For example, an integer type or a currency or a date or a decimal or whatever, they just have to be the same, the same type. So here's step one. We'll walk through these different steps. Step one is you create a safe search that is the value that you want to store. And so I'm going to go through, um, and I know this is small and I cannot zoom in because I'm not live, but we're, I'm going to go through the criteria, the results, the highlighting, and the available filters tabs in these next four slides. So the first set here is um, the criteria. So this is an item search. Okay, so I'm, I'm doing this. Uh, basically, what I'm going to do here is, is calculate all of the sales on a, for a specific item within the last year, okay? One year sales. So the transaction type is either an invoice or a cash sale. So invoice or cash sale are the end of the line for sales. If you do it on sales orders, the problem there is that then you have to define the, the status of the sales order so that you don't get sales orders that have been closed and don't end up in actual sales. So if you go to invoices or cash sales directly, then those are just, those are the real deal. Like those are the things that actually happen. Um, and then the transaction date, I'm going to say anything that's within 365 days ago up until now. And this is when you set the transaction date to go backwards, you, this is a little bit weird. You might have to experiment with a little bit, but you basically have to say is within 365 ago up till zero days ago. And so this, so that's a dynamic calculation. It'll, it'll look one year back all the time. Okay. So that's the criteria. The next one is the results. So the results tab is going to be the value that you want to store. So in this case, the um, I'm going to have a transaction quantity. And so I'm looking for the number of items sold in the last 365 days. You could also say transaction amount and sum up the amount, or you can sum up the quantity. In this case, I'm just going to sum the quantity. So that is the, the one value, the one field that I'm going to... Um, that I'm going to uh, display as the result. Oh, I didn't do, I, I don't need anything for highlighting. Um, on the available filters, this is a critical step. 
On the available filters, the filter has to, has to be the internal ID. It doesn't have to show on the save search. And in fact, if you show the save search, it's pretty much meaningless because it's not gonna show any results um, when you just run it on its own. It's all designed to kind of work in the background. So this is the key is the filter is uh, internal ID. So this is really small, I know, but basically you can see the previous, this is what it would look like when you run it. Um, previous one year of sales is like, it just has a, one number, seven, it doesn't tell you what it is, doesn't matter. This is not for you. This is to, for it to work in the background. So that's the safe search to create the value of the field that you want to store. The next step is to create the two custom fields for the record. So um, I would name these fields very similarly. I, the first one, I'm, this is prior one year sales, non-stored. This field is not going to show up on the record. It's going to be there, but it's not going to be visible on the record. So in this case, I'm going to apply it to the inventory item. And then um, under the display sub tab, it's just going to be a hidden field on the item record. Okay. This is, again, is not for you. This is to work in the background so that we can take that stored field and, and act, um, populate the correct value. So here's um, the second part of this field or uh, field number one is um, the search. So under the validation and defaulting tab, the search is going to be the search that you created in step one. And that search is basically what is gonna be populating the value of this non-stored field. And you'll also notice here, I don't know if I have a, yeah, um, this, this store value option is unchecked and you have to make sure that that is unchecked because this is the non-stored value field, okay? And I know I'm going fast, sake of time. I'm gonna publish these, this slide deck later on and then you can ask me questions through LinkedIn if you want to. So field number two, this is the stored value. So this is basically an identical field except for we're storing the value and we are not doing the validation and defaulting on this one, but we are going to have this to display type normal. So this is a field that's going to show on the item record. Okay, so those are our two custom fields. Then the save search for records to update. I'm gonna say this is a saved item search. The type is inventory item and inactive is false. So basically this is gonna run on every single inventory item that's in my system. Um, for the results, it doesn't matter what you show here because this is not for you. Again, this is to run in the background. This is to determine what gets triggered. I usually just put like internal ID or name or description or something like that um, on, the, on the results of this search. But this is what we're gonna, this search we're gonna call up in the workflow. Okay, so last step is you're gonna create a workflow. Um, this is the basic setup on the workflow. It's very simple workflow. I name it again, like I name it what I, something descriptive, and then please write a description of what it is so that if somebody else comes in and looks at this later, they are like, what does this workflow do? I don't know. Then they got to like dig in and figure it out. Um, so this is a record type of items. The subtype is inventory part. Um, I always execute as admin. I can't think of a reason why you would not ever want to do that. Um, I'm going to leave it as release status testing. And then um, for testing purposes, I always keep the instance in history and then enable logging. Um, to trigger this workflow, it's going to be scheduled. I am going to schedule it based on the save search that I created in step three. So this is where we define the save search that, run, that it runs on. So all of the item records that I defined in that save search, this is, what, this is where it's going to pull all of that in. I'm gonna repeat this task uh, or this workflow uh, weekly. Um, I can, I'm gonna run it at, in the middle of the night on a Sunday. So when you come in on a Monday morning, you know that you, all of your items have a fresh set of information that has been populated over the weekend. Um, you could run it every 30 minutes if you want. You could run it uh, every once a day if you want. It just depends on your business needs. Um, so that's all changeable right there. The next step is to um, set the action. So this is the action. And what I'm gonna do is just trigger on entry. It's very simple. You don't have to get complicated with this one. Um, there's only gonna be one action. Actually, I do two for testing, but one action on the workflow. Uh, trigger on entry. And then here's the magic part. So the field, oh, I'm sorry. This action is 
um, what's it called? Update. Set field value, thank you, set field value. That's one thing I forgot to put in here. That's the name of this action is set field value. So set field value is triggering on entry. I'm gonna, this is the stored field, okay? Cause it doesn't, and I know that cause it doesn't say non-stored. And then I'm going to source the value to store in there from the non-stored field. So what NetSuite's gonna do is it's gonna look at that non-stored field. It's gonna run the save search that that field's tied to and then it's gonna populate the stored value in the other field. That makes sense? Okay. Um, you could also, you don't have to do it in this formula section. If that field is on your record, you could say from, from field, current record, and then find the field in this dropdown list if you want to. It should show up there as well. So that's the, I think that's everything in a nutshell. Oh, so just a couple of, um, kind of pro tips, I like to always send an email to myself when a workflow runs um, for testing purposes. So when the workflow runs, I know that uh, I can go back to those records and I can look and make sure that what I expected to happen happened to that record. And in this case, I'm only gonna use it for testing. So when the workflow is in a release status of testing and you click this execute now button, NetSuite is gonna run the workflow on the first 20 records that are in the save search that we defined in step three. So, so what's gonna happen is I'm gonna get 20 emails and cause it's gonna run on 20 different records. So 20 emails, that's not a big deal, right? I can go in, I can look at five or 10 of those and just make sure that all of the values got, got calculated based on what I, what I would expect to see. When you're done, with that testing and you're confident that everything has worked correctly, um, go in and turn off the email action. Otherwise you have a thousand items in your system. You'll get a thousand emails when that runs at Sunday at 12 a.m., okay? Um, so I know that was really fast and I hope it makes sense. Um, I'll post the slide deck on our uh, website. Um, it's basically like a blog post. And then also, if you have any questions on this process, you can ask me, uh, you can email me directly, or you can ask the LinkedIn form, which is ideal because then other people get to benefit from uh, the question and answer as well. So, yes. Yeah. Because um, I've come across a same exact issue, and I solved it in a way, it had one field, for value, but in the workflow, if you did a after record submit, and put your formula into the formula field there, appears to then, Instead of putting the formula on the field, put the formula within the workflow. Yeah. And set that field. You can do the same thing. You can, yeah, you can use that calculation in the workflow, but there are calculations and summaries that you can do in a safe search that you cannot do in a, in a formula like that. And that's where the power of this comes in, I think, is using really leveraging safe searches and all of, all of the, fun, the calculations you can do there to populate anything you want. But you're absolutely right. You could just put a formula in the box to populate that field. If it's like this plus this, you know, it's perfect for that. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Awesome. Thank you for your time. Um, thank you. And so uh, at this point, we're going to have our open forum. Um, Mike Kackline is going to host that for us. Um, we have a microphone. I would prefer if you speak into the microphone so that everybody can hear. Uh, it's a handheld mic, so, we, so we'll run around with that microphone. Uh, give us a chance to ask any questions, uh, challenges, problems that you're having. And then also for the remote uh, attendees, this is the end of the uh, broadcast part of this meeting. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the go-to meeting. Um, and then everything that we've done today is recorded and it will be posted on our website uh, to view later on as well. So thank you.